So as we open Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, uh, man, I'm excited about this chapter. You probably are familiar with this chapter, Hebrews 11, even if you're new to the Bible or you haven't studied the scriptures a whole lot. Hebrews chapter 11 is often referred to as the hall of faith. Anybody heard it uh, called that before? The hall of faith, okay? And that's typically what Bible students refer to this chapter as. And uh, it's because, as we will see as we dive into this, it's a record, it's a recounting, a remembrance of the faith of so many of the individuals in the Old Testament. Okay, throughout the ages, from, from Abraham uh, forward, from, actually we're going to start with Abel, which if you remember Cain and Abel, they were the sons of the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. It's going to go all the way back to Abel and speak about his faith and then onward to others, to Abraham, and then forward throughout the Old Testament just recounts the faith of all these different men of God. And there's going to be one woman in the mix as well in this list, which is profound. We're going to talk about that uh, later in the chapter, but it records the faith of the men and women of the Old Testament and uh, how they lived out their faith. And that's what I want to talk about today. Faith is meant to be lived out. Faith is not something, guys, that's just meant to stay private. Faith is not something that should just stay in our minds or in our hearts. Faith ought to be something that is seen, that can be observed, that can be touched, that can be felt. And what, what do I mean by that? What do you mean faith can be touched or felt? I thought faith was invisible. But as we will talk about true faith, real faith is not something that is invisible. Faith is not just some esoteric, far out there intellectual theory. It's not some hypothetical belief that's just contained in the invisible realm of our minds or our hearts. But faith ought to be something that is actual, that is real, that is material. Not just something that is hypothetical. Many people, I think, relegate their faith to this, this department that is really not seen. It, their faith is very private. You ever heard someone say that before? My faith is very private. And I would say, man, faith is not supposed to just be private. Oh, it should be first private. Amen? You see what I'm saying? Our faith should be something private. Yes, it should be something that we, we own. We we, we uh, man, possess, we, we take ownership over and we, we say, this is my faith, it's a personal faith. Yes, it should be that, but it should also be not just personal, private, but it should be very public. The world today, though, doesn't want that, do they? The world today says, just keep your faith to yourself, right? That's great if you have faith. That's great you believe in this or that. But just keep it to yourself, and we'll all be fine. Well, that's the big lie, isn't it? That's the big lie of the enemy. Satan says, just keep your faith to yourself. Don't share it with anyone else. You see, Satan doesn't have a problem with you and me having faith, believing in God, trusting him, walking with him, as long as we keep it to ourselves. But we know God has called us to something other than just keeping faith inside. He said, no, let that faith out. Share your faith with others. Tell others about it. Testify to them of what God's done for you. And that's what our faith ought to be. Something that is seen, that is felt, that can be touched by others. In the book of James, which we're going to study after we get done with Hebrews, but in the book of James, chapter 2, James really brings this out, and he says, starting in verse 14 of James, James chapter 2, you can flip a few pages to the right in your Bible if you want to follow along with me. There in James chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Interesting. Now, many people read this and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, wait on, hold on a minute. 
you know, we'll just wait up because this sounds like it's contradicting another verse. In Galatians chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. For by grace, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, You're saved by grace. What is grace? What's the definition of grace? Gift, right? Grace is a gift. It's something you receive that you didn't earn, you didn't deserve, you didn't work for. That's what grace is. For by grace you've been saved. So that means God saves us as a gift. A lot of people are working to try and get saved. But God says that's not how it works. Amen? You're, you're, a lot of people are trying to work their way into salvation. But Paul says, no, salvation is a gift of God. It's gr by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works. So Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that the way we get saved, the way we obtain salvation, forgiveness of our sins, and thereby entrance into heaven, we get to go to heaven, is a gift of God that's received by placing our faith, which we're talking a lot about today, by placing our faith in his work on the cross. That is how we're saved. Not by the, own, the works of our, our own life or of our own doing. We've talked about this a lot lately, haven't we? We are saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's his finished work on the cross, his perfect life being sacrificed, and taking the punishment of death for our sin. That is the finished work of Christ, and our faith in that is what saves us, not works of our own. So Paul makes that so clear in Ephesians 2. Then people read this over here in James chapter 2, and they go, wait a minute now. James says, what use is it if someone says they have faith, but they have no works? Can that faith save him? James seems to be questioning what Paul says in Ephesians 2. James seems to be putting in question that we can be saved by faith alone. Now, I want to point something out here that not all faith is equal. Not all faith is the same. There are different kinds of faith. There are varying degrees and measures of faith. When Paul talks about gifts of the Spirit, he says, let each man uh, exercise their gift according to their faith. Each according to his faith. Meaning, when we exercise the spiritual gifts God has given us, we can exercise those in a little amount or a large amount, depending on how much faith we have. So there's different varying degrees and amounts of faith that we can have. There's also different things that we can put faith in. Amen? There's also uh, different kinds of faith. There's faith that makes sense, and there's something called blind faith, which really doesn't make sense. Many people accuse us as Christians of being those who have blind faith. Oh, I would disagree strongly. We, we are not those who just blindly put our faith in something that has no evidence or anything going for it or has no proof. On the contrary, we are putting our faith and our trust in a God, in a gospel that has been proven as much as anything can be proven systematically through fulfilled prophecy in God's word. Not only that, but logically it makes sense. Cons there's consistency throughout the Bible. It's not contradicting each other. You're like, well, what about this verse we're looking at right now? This seems like a contradiction. Does God contradict himself? Does God say this here and then say something that contradicts it over here? No, he doesn't. So if we look at God's word and it's confusing to us, is it God's word that's confusing? Or is it just us that's confused? Is, is the problem with God's word that, oh, God is messed up here. There's a mistake. Is there a mistake or are we just not seeing it clearly? I'll give you the answer. It's us who aren't seeing clearly. God's word is not at fault. His word, his law, the law of the Lord is perfect. 
God's word is perfect. We just don't always understand it. First reading sometimes, have you ever read something before and got the wrong idea from it? Because you just read it quickly? Or again, we talked about this last week, but you don't read something within context. You don't read the context in which it's written, and so you get the wrong idea from it. And so when we are confused, we believe there's a contradiction. It's not God who's contradicting. It's our failure and our inability, perhaps, to understand. And so here, we need to seek to understand what James is saying about faith in chapter 2. He's saying, and I quote this again, verse 14 of James 2, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith? Notice, this is someone claiming they have faith. They say they have faith, but he has no works. Can that faith save him? Notice he says that faith. He doesn't question, can faith save a person? Oh, I believe James would agree with Paul and say, hey, we're saved by faith. But what kind of faith are we saved by? Are we saved by just any kind of faith? Are we saved by a so-called faith that, that is not informed? Are we saved by an uninformed faith? What do you mean by that? I mean, some people have faith in all sorts of things. People have faith in a politician. I personally don't have a whole lot of faith in politicians. That's misplaced faith. Others have faith in a fairy tale or a fictitious um, personality of some sort. Santa Claus, right? Something. I'm sorry. Did I just say that? There's no kids in here, right? But the Easter bunny, you know, something like that. The, the fairy godmother, they, they put their faith in things that are fictitious. They don't know what that word means yet, so we're good, all right? But they put their faith in these things, and yet they don't exist. And so we need to make sure that our faith is in something that not only exists, but here James says there are different types of faith. Can the faith, the type of faith that is not accompanied by any works, save a person? Someone who says, I have faith. Well, what do you have faith in? I don't, I don't know. I believe, I believe God exists. Can that faith save a person? That's my question right now. Can that type of faith save a person? I, I believe in God. There's a lot of people that believe in God. The statistics prove it, don't they? When, when a survey is done of the United States and they say, how many Christians are there that believe in the, the God of the Bible? And, you know, the statistics are, are pretty surprising, aren't they? Like, wow, like 60%, what, of, of America believe in God? Wow, it sure doesn't look like it. Man, it sure doesn't sound like it when I talk with people. That's because we're not talking about the same thing, are we? When someone says, I believe in God, what, what do they mean by that? What do they mean when they say, I believe in God? Are they talking about some just higher power? Are they talking about God in a general sense? There's a lot of different beliefs and theologies about God. We are those who believe in theism, that there is one God, monotheism, that there is one God, and that he is a God who's created everything and who is involved in our world. But there are other beliefs out there. There's deism and pantheism and all sorts of other polytheism that believes in many gods. And so when someone says, I have faith or I, I believe in God, what do they mean by that? And we have to make sure, guys, that we have placed our faith in the right place. Because otherwise, your faith may not save you. We're saved by faith, yes, but faith in what? Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saved by faith in who God is as revealed in scripture. We're not saved by just any sort of faith. And so that is James's point in James chapter 2. That faith should be accompanied by works. Read verse 17 of James 2 with me. He says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Verse 19, he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, James says in verse 20, that faith without works is useless? James's point here is that salvation 
comes by a faith that is not hypothetical. James is saying we are saved by a faith that is not dead. We're saved by a faith that is not inactive. We are saved by a faith that works, that is accompanied by good works. Well, I thought you said we weren't saved by works. We're not saved by the works, but we're saved by a faith that is real. Amen? We're saved by a faith that is not just a question mark in our minds or an idea. We're saved by a faith that is, that is confident, that knows what it believes. We're saved by a faith that is well-informed, a faith that is placed solely in the work of Christ, his finished work on the cross, and a faith that results in us doing good works as well. Jesus said, didn't he, you'll know a tree by its fruit. He said if it's, if, a, if it's a bad tree, it's going to bear bad fruit. But a good tree will bear good fruit. And guys, if you have saving faith in your life, you've put your trust in Jesus, guess what? Good works are going to flow from your life. Good things, God's going to be bringing change in your life. Does this mean you now live perfectly? No, we know that, right? None of us is perfect. However, God is going to be working in you. There's going to be changing going on in you. If you say, hey, I put my faith in Jesus, but I'm not seeing anything change in my life. I haven't seen anything happen. I would say you might want to make your calling an election, sure. Make sure that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that you've asked him into your life, that you've asked his forgiveness over your sins, that you've You've given your life truly to him, that it's not just a game you're playing, that it's not just something that you would say, I said a prayer at a camp once, or I raised my hand at a concert once, so I'm good, right? Well, what the word says here is that not just any sort of faith can save you. You don't get saved by just saying a prayer, by, by repeating words that a pastor leads you in. You can get saved that way if you mean them in your heart, and it's true faith that is being enacted upon. But you can also say that prayer and not get saved. You can say that prayer and just say it in your mind or not really put your, your confidence in it and give your life to it. And so we must be careful. Verse 24 of James chapter 2, then we'll go back to Hebrews. James says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Ooh, again, like, wow, that looks like a, contradiction, but you see what he's saying. He's talking about we are saved by a faith, not faith and works. Again, Paul says you're saved by grace through faith, not by works. James is not saying you're saved by works and faith. He's saying you're saved by faith that works. Not faith and works, but faith that works. Guys, if you're saying, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm there's no good works coming from my life. Again, make sure you're saved. Cry out to the Lord, I want to make sure I'm saved. Are you living inside of me? Because I thought I was good, but I don't see any change happening. And, and man, I don't, that's one thing you don't want to get wrong. Amen? That's one, one area for sure. You don't want to assume you're good to go. And then find out, come to find out when you're standing before God, you weren't good to go. You were one of those who thought they were good to go, who, who played the part and said the deal, but it wasn't saving faith. So true faith is faith that works. And that goes along with the title of my teaching today, Faith in Action. Now we're going to see faith in action in this chapter. Let's read verse 1 together of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. Faith, he says, he defines faith here. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is being sure of what you hope for. That's what faith is. Faith is not, uh, does not have a question mark attached to it. Faith is something that has an assurance. I am sure of this by faith. And, and it's not blind faith. Again, it's an informed faith, informed by God's word. Guys, I don't put my faith in much else other than what's in God's word. When, when the Bible says it, then I believe it, and I can put my confidence in it. 
Because when God, again, when he says something, it's going to come to pass. 100%. When I say something, it doesn't always come to pass. 100%. When you say something, you you say, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'm going to get to that. It doesn't always happen. But when God says it, you can be sure of it. So faith is being sure, having assurance of things hoped for. It's a conviction of things that are not seen. But again, that faith ought to be seen. Now, verse 3. We're going to pick up a pattern here that I want to point out. But it it starts now talking about faith. And it says in verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, he says, we understand. Again, our, our faith in Christianity, our faith in the word of God, our faith in God as the creator, who the Bible says spoke the worlds into existence, spoke the universe, spoke matter into existence. That faith in, in God as creator is not a blind faith. People today will accuse Christians of being uninformed or being unintelligent Because we talk about an intelligent designer. A God who, with supreme intelligence, designed and orchestrated creation. Put it together and created it and coded it. And It doesn't take long to study creation, whether small things or big things, to see that there was someone behind it. Amen? That there's a design, that there's an order, that there's an intelligence, that an engineer, if you will, that, that created these things. In fact, even today, you know, our human engineers, men model machinery and processes and technology after what? After creation. Constantly, engineers are creating things and making moving parts that mimic what God has already made. Why? Because it's so perfect. It, it, because it works so well. They're taking notes from, as, as little c creators, men that are creating things and engineering and designing and inventing things, they're taking notes from creation. They're taking notes from matter and from the cell and from the cosmos to create these little things and machines and inventions. Because God is the ultimate creator. Random chance does not produce those things. No matter how much time you give it. We could talk a lot about that, but... It's by faith that we understand that. Meaning what? Even though it makes sense that God created everything and, and that what we see in creation is well explained by God being the one who made it. it. Even though it makes sense, it takes faith to understand it. Doesn't it? It still takes faith. Why? Because we were not eyewitnesses of creation, were we? Well, at least I wasn't. You weren't there, were you? If you were, get up here and tell us about it. But none of us were there for creation when God made the heavens and the earth. When he said, let there be light. When he made the animals and the birds and the fish and the clouds and the stars and the universe, all of that. When God made it, we weren't there. We were not eyewitnesses. So because of that, we have to exercise a little bit of faith, even though it makes sense and we understand it. So we exercise faith By doing something. By what? We understand. We understand. Verse 4. It says now, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Talks about Cain and Abel here. And how Abel, he is still speaking to us today. How? By his example, through his life, he's still speaking something to us. If you recall the story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve created in the garden of God. They sinned. They were cast out. Their their sons, Cain and Abel, were bringing an offering to the Lord. And the Lord only accepted animal sacrifice, bloodshed as an offering to him for sin. That's the way it's always been. Even when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when they ate the forbidden fruit... What did God offer up as an offering to cover their sin? What were they covered with? Remember, they tried to cover themselves with what? Fig leaves, right? They took some like leaves off the the trees and thought, this will cover up our mistake. 
And God's like, whoa, why, why are you hiding? Like, well, what, what do you got to hide? What's be, you know? It's like when you catch your, your son or your daughter doing something they shouldn't do. Like, they're all acting awkward, right? Holding something behind their back. What you got there, right? What you holding behind your back? And Adam and Eve were just kind of hiding out. And whenever someone's hiding, you know they're trying to hide something. There's, there's a guilty conscience there. And, and they were trying to hide themselves with fig leaves. God said, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to work. And so he covered them with animal skins. Now, it doesn't specifically say where he got those animal skins, but we can pretty easily deduce where he got them from, right? Probably from animals, right? <laughs> Who are no longer living, I would assume, after God put them to death, took their, their coverings, took their skins, and covered Adam and Eve with them. And so Cain and Abel, when it was time to offer God a sacrifice, it was, had already been established, that's the way that sin is dealt with. That's the offering you bring to God. But we're told that Abel, he brought that offering to God, a sacrifice, an animal to the Lord as an offering. But Cain, who was a gardener who tilled the land, he came and brought the, the fruit of the land, the fruit of his labors. And thought, man, I've grown all these vegetables and fruits and whatever. And here you go, Lord. And he brought the Lord a fruit basket. See, even then, a fruit basket wasn't a good gift, right? <laughs> Way back then, God's like, that's not what, give me meat. <laughs> you know, my wife knows me well. That's all I got for Christmas, pretty much, is meat. Praise the Lord. I got like jerky. I got pepperoni sticks. I got different kinds of, I, m you should see my desk at work. It's just like packed full. I'm loaded for, for a few days at least. I'm set to go. I got a problem with jerky, but I love meat. God required meat. He required the bloodshed of an animal in order to cover their sin. Abel brought that by faith. Cain he brought, not by faith, not trusting God's way, he came his own way to God and said, no, I don't want to come to God that way, but that's the only way you can come to God. Many people today, they do that. Oh, why, why is Jesus the only way? Why is that? Because that's the sacrifice that God has provided as the way to him. Well, can I come to God this other way? With the things, I'll put this thing together. Here you go, Lord, I want to come to you this way. God's like, I, I can't accept that. That doesn't work. That's not going to cut it. Why are we so set on doing it our way sometimes? Why are people so set on doing it their own way? I'll tell you why. Because we like, we like to do it ourselves. We don't want to ask God for his way. We don't want to do it. His, we don't want to ask for help. We, we, we want to do it our own way. We want to be able to come to God and say, I did it. I put this thing together and I, I worked hard for this and here you go, Lord, and now it's all, it's worked out and I can pat myself on the back for that. Way to go, Daniel. Yeah, you did that. We, we enjoy that sense of accomplishment. But the problem is when we do it God's way, we don't get a pat on the back. When we approach God through his sacrifice, we don't get credit for it. We don't get glory for it. And that's exactly the way the Lord wants it. That's exactly the way it needs to be. He gets all the glory. Amen? Man, come to the Lord his way. But it was by faith, notice it says there in verse 4, that Abel offered to God. That's an action. Faith in action. Abel offered. That was his action. His act of faith to show that he believed God and trusted God's way. He offered the right sacrifice. Now next in verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Enoch. You remember him? Enoch. Right? Don't forget it. Enoch was living in the days of Noah prior to the flood, the great deluge that came upon the world. Enoch was a man who was living at that time, and it says that by faith, Enoch was taken up. He was taken up by faith. Now, interesting. How did Enoch's faith 
result in him being taken up to heaven. If you recall, remember God had declared, I'm going to bring a judgment upon the world by flood that's going to kill all the inhabitants, all the animals, and all the, the people alive, except for Noah, I'm going to spare you and your family, and you're going to put two of every kind of animal on the ark, right? And that whole thing, you guys know, build this ark. And during that time, prior to that time, Enoch was a man who was walking with God, who was pleasing to God, which means he had faith in God. Because again, verse 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. So Enoch was just a man who's walking with God. And it was his faith that resulted in God taking, taking him out. Now, why did God take Enoch out? Why did, he, why did he remove Enoch from the world? Now, Enoch didn't die. He didn't, God didn't take him out like a hitman, okay? God removed him, translated him. All of a sudden, Enoch walked with God, Genesis says, and then he was not, for God took him. He was just walking with God and then pew, gone. The Lord's like, get up here. Reminds us of something else, where the people of God are just walking with God, then all of a sudden, phew, they're gone. Interesting. Enoch, a great picture of the rapture of the church. God calling his people up to heaven prior to the great judgment coming. Interesting. But even with the great judgment coming, there were some who would be preserved through that great judgment. No one is family, representing, I believe, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. Anyway, that's another teaching. But Enoch was taken by God. Why? That was an act of faith. His, his life with the Lord, his walk with the Lord was so profound, was so awesome that the Lord's just like, Enoch, I can't take this anymore. You, I just want you to be up here with me. And the Lord spared him from his wrath, spared him from that judgment which was to come. And Enoch's story here tells us that Faith is not just, again, some belief or something in our minds, but faith is something that is walked out, that is lived out. Our faith, guys, we should be walking like Enoch in a way that pleases God as Christians. If you say, I have faith, but you're not walking that out, you're not living it out like James, really? You say you have faith, but you have no works. Can that faith really save a person? Man, something somber to consider. So Enoch, man, he was walking with God. He had faith in God, and he was taken. That was his faith in action. He was taken by, taken by God. Verse 7, taken isn't a word, if any of you caught that. Verse 7, now by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah, what did he do? He prepared an ark. You see, we're going to see this over and over and over and over again. Faith is mentioned 25 times in this chapter alone. No, no surprise then why it's referred to as the faith chapter or the hall of faith. But every time, faith is accompanied by an action, guys. You see the point here? It's faith in action. Not just some private, personal faith that never gets out. No. Faith is to be acted out, lived out, shared with others, to result in things that we do. Noah's act of faith was to prepare an ark. Noah knew that judgment was coming. God had pronounced judgment upon the world at that time. And so he planned accordingly. What did he do? He prepared safety. He prepared an ark for his family. Guys, we know by faith, judgment is coming. Amen? And I don't mean some like doom and gloom, like meteor out of the sky. Like we know, Revelation talks about that God is going to bring his judgment. Through the tribulation, his, the second coming of Christ, right? God's bringing judgment in that way, but Ultimately, for all of us, judgment is coming. We are going to stand before the God of the universe. Because we know judgment is coming, what are we doing to prepare for that? Noah prepared not only for himself, but he prepared for his family. 
Man, what are you doing to prepare your family for the coming judgment? Moms, dads, are you encouraging your kids? Are you teaching them the ways of the Lord? Are you helping your kids get in the word and learn the ways of salvation? Are you praying with them? Are you helping gr- build and grow their faith? Or are you, are you actually hindering them from being prepared for salvation? Are you actually distracting them? Are you turning them away from, turning them off from wanting the way of salvation? Noah, he prepared for the salvation of his family. It was an act. It was an action in his life. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So number one, we're going to see several acts of faith here in Abraham's life in the following verses. But number one, Abraham, his first act of faith was that he went out. You guys, faith in our life, what does faith look like? Again, not just some hypothetical idea, but faith is an action. It's outward. Faith looks like going somewhere. Faith is stepping out into the unknown. For, for Abraham, God called him. Faith called him to step out into unknown territory. What unknown territory in your life is God calling you to step into that's scary? Where there's questions, where you're not sure what's going to be there, what's going to happen there. But when God calls you to do something, it takes faith to step out into that in obedience. Abraham did that. He acted on his faith. He didn't say, Lord, I have faith in you. Just So if you want me to do that, then I trust you'll make that happen. Faith calls us to act. How many times do we say that sort of statement? Lord, if this is your will, just just do it. Lord, if that's your will, just make it happen. But oftentimes the Lord is saying, this is my will, I want you to do it. And we turn around and say, Lord, well, if it's really your will, you do it. You see, it's, it's been wisely said that without God, we can't. But without us, he won't. Let me say that again. Without God, we can't do this or do that. Without God, we can't get saved without him. But without us, he won't. Meaning, he won't force us. He won't do it. He requires our involvement in this thing. Lord, if you want my family member to get saved, you just save them, Lord. And Lord might be saying, I I want you to go share with them. I want to use you to save them. My good friend Ben Corson said at a winter retreat years ago, I remember, maybe some of you guys were there, but Ben said, faith can move mountains, but don't be surprised if God hands you a shovel. And that was profound, and it's obviously stuck with me. Oftentimes, faith can move mountains. I believe, Lord, you could do this. And the Lord's like, yes, I can, through you. Here's a shovel. Get to digging. But we don't like that part of it, do we? We become lazy with our faith. God calls us to action. Abraham stepped out into unknown territory. Verse 9, as also on top of that, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents, with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. It says, secondly, Abraham lived out his faith. He acted on his faith by doing what? By living as a, an alien, as an outsider, as a foreigner in the place where God called him. God has called us to a place where we are not at home. Amen. The Bible says that our citizenship is in heaven. We are not citizens of this world. We don't belong here. We belong with the Lord in heaven. That is where we belong. Our home, our hope, our citizenship is in heaven. It's not here and now. And faith calls us to be okay with being an outsider, with being a foreigner, with being an alien. Are you okay with that? See, so many Christians... 
They say, I believe, but I, I, wanna, I also want to fit in. I want people here to like me. I want to be a part of this world system and be accepted into it. Well, faith's going to call you to live a different way. Faith calls us to live separate from this world, to be set apart. Literally, that's what the word holy means, where God says, be holy for I am holy. The word there, hagios, it means to be set apart, to be different than those around you. God's called us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different, to be aliens. Some of us look like aliens. No, I'm just kidding. You're not that bad looking. <laughs> I'm just... But faith will call us, faith will call us to live that sort of way, to not blend in with the world around us. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now we read of the faith of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Remember, they were old, without child, yet God promised they would have a son who would grow into a large nation, which today is the nation of Israel. But they had no kids at that time. And they were advanced in years. That's the nice way of putting it, right? They were ancient. They were super old, okay? And... They were like, we can't have kids anymore. But by faith, Sarah, it says, believed the Lord for that. And she was able to conceive. Now, when you read the stories that we're recounting here, that the author of Hebrews is, is commending these great acts of faith over and over again. You remember the story of Abraham and Sarah when God promised them a son? Do we see necessarily no, just nothing but great faith in that story? Or do we see a lot of oscillating? Do we see a lot of meddling in God's plan? Remember that whole thing? It says by faith, Sarah was able to conceive. But before that great faith came, something else came. Something called Ishmael came into the picture. And how'd that happen? Remember, Sarah was doubting God's plan, saying, I don't think I'm... I'm able to conceive and have a child. So Abraham, why don't you try with my handmaid, this young, you know, Egyptian handmaid in Hagar, have a child with her. And Abraham didn't put up a fight. You know, again, Sarah being advanced in years, here's a young handmaid and Abraham wanted, guys, they, they never grow up, do they? You old guys are like, nope, we don't. I've heard guys say that before, that no matter how old you get, you're, you always feel like you're 18 or you're 20 or you still... We were watching a show the, the other day, and it had this old guy in it. And he, even like at 80, he's like, I still got it, you know? And uh, so, guys, man, they got issues. But Abraham, <laughs> Abraham agrees to that plan, has a child with Hagar. We don't necessarily, necessarily see this great faith being acted out in the story. But here in the retelling of it, in the New Testament, this side of Christ coming and dying for the sins, we don't hear about all their mistakes, do we? We don't hear about all the blunders. We don't hear about all the meddling and the, uh, the, the doubting and the, the mess-ups and the sin in the story. We just read about great faith. And guys, I think that's how it's going to be when we get to heaven. That's when we see Christ, and 1 Corinthians 3 says that all the wood, hay, and stubble will be burnt, and the gold, silver, and precious stones will remain. Man, we're going to get to heaven. God's going to be like, man, look at all this awesome stuff you did. And you're like, ah, how did you get that? How did you get this, all these jewels and gold out of, out of that? Like, how did you get this from that? I mean, my life was riddled with sin and mistakes and doubt and, and fears and and wow, Lord, look what you have done. I think again, it will just be, Lord, look what you have done. Amen? Beauty from ashes. Lord, you've brought something awesome from my life that was very tainted and dirty and messed up. And so we see here, commend Sarah for her great faith to conceive. Why? Because she considered him faithful who had promised. Isn't that awesome? She considered him faithful. Why did she give Hagar to her husband? Because she thought she was unable. She was focused too much on her own inability, and it caused her to sin. How much, how much of the time do we do that? Do we make that same mistake? 
Lord calls us to do something. The Lord says, I'm going to do this. We go, no, no, I can't do this. I'm unable. And we, it leads us to do stupid stuff and mess up God's plan and not walk in faith to see the promise fulfilled that God has declared. It wasn't until Sarah considered him faithful. Guys, once we realize it really doesn't have to do with us and our inability and our unfaithfulness and our, our, our mess-ups and who we are in our frailty and our feebleness, once we get over that and realize it's about his faithfulness, that God can do miracles, he can do wonders, even with you and me. It's in spite of you and me. That it's not because of you and me. Oh, God's going to do something great because I'm so awesome. No. God can't do anything because I'm not awesome. No. God can do things awesome because he's awesome. Yes. Now you're getting it. And once Sarah got that, they conceived. They had a child. His name was Isaac. He would become the father of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And the rest is history. Sarah has this great faith here. Verse 12. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead. Abraham's like, thanks. Right? He was as good as dead at that, it says. As many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And that was God's promise to them, that he would multiply them that greatly. Verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Beautiful, awesome. Notice what it says there in verse 13. Though all these people, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and that they all, they died in faith without receiving the promises. They didn't necessarily see all the promises fulfilled in their lifetime. Did Abraham get to see his family multiplied as the sand of the seashore? No, he didn't get to see that in his lifetime. But he had his faith in God that God would do what he said he was going to do. That he considered God is faithful to what he promises. Are you learning that in your life? Have you learned that, that God is faithful no matter what? And you got to hang on to that even when you're not seeing the promise fulfilled. Even when the doubts come in and say, nah, it's not going to happen. And you start focusing on your own problems and your own inabilities and your own inadequacies. And you got to remember, God is faithful. Now verse 17 it says, now by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, Isaac, your descendants shall be called. In Isaac, your descendants shall be called. Verse 19, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. What's that mean? As a type, as a picture. A picture of what? What is everything a picture of? Jesus. It talks about Abraham when he was tested. God finally gave him because they considered God faithful. Abraham and Sarah had the child, Isaac. And then at some point, God said to Abraham, all right, God, I want you to take Isaac, your only son. You know, the son that I promised I would give to you. The son that I said many descendants, like the sand of the seashore, would come from this son. I want you to take that son who has had no kids yet, who, who doesn't have descendants yet. I want you to take that only son. I want you to go up and offer him, sacrifice him. God told Abraham. You think there was a little bit of wrestling there? You think he was like, okay, Lord. It was probably like, what? But ultimately, Abraham surrendered, submitted to the Lord, took his son Isaac up on the hill, up on the mount, 
interesting. It's the same mount. It's the same hill that we call Calvary. Can you believe that? It's almost too hard to believe, isn't it? Mount Moriah, where God told Abraham, take your son Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him, is the same mountain where Jesus would one day hang, where God would give his only begotten son to be sacrificed for our sins. But Abraham, in obedience, took Isaac up there. On the way up, of course, we recount how Isaac said, hey, Dad, you know, we've, we've got the wood, you know, for the fire, and we've got all this stuff, but where's the sacrifice? Where, where's, the, where's the animal? Where's the lamb? Where's the ram? Where's the goat? Where's the bull? What, what do we, we're going up to make a sacrifice to the Lord, but we got everything but the sacrifice. And Abraham, of course, responds to his son. It's telling there that he hadn't told his son yet. And perhaps is why many commentators and Bible scholars believe that at this point in time, Isaac was somewhere around the age of 40, perhaps. His dad was like 100 and something. Okay? So if Abraham had told Isaac down in the valley, hey, we're going to go up and kill you on the mountain. God told me to do it. He's like, okay, dad, you've lost it. <laughs> right? We're getting you in a home. Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that's the last straw, dad. Right, he probably would have, would have questioned perhaps because God spoke that to Abraham, not to Isaac. So he, he goes up there with Isaac and Isaac says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says what? He says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now a little play on words there. I don't think Abraham knew what he was saying. I think Abraham was saying, God will provide the sacrifice. But he specifically says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Not that God will provide for himself a sacrifice, but God will provide himself for the sacrifice. A prophetic word of what God himself would do in Jesus Christ on that same mountain. This was all as a type. Abraham knew, there's no way a nation's going to be birthed from, from my son Isaac if I put him to death. But he believed God so powerful and so faithful to his word that, all right, Lord, if you're telling me to do this, then you must, you must be raising him back from the dead to have kids and to continue on this because your, your word is not going to fail. Your word is not going to fall. Your promise is true. Your promise is sure, Lord. And so he went through with it, went up there, and just, you know the story, just as he raised the knife, the Lord called out to him and said, Abraham, wait. Hold on. And the Lord provided there. In the thicket, in the brush, there was a sacrifice. It was a test. What was the point of all this? Of course, it was a picture of Christ. But in Abraham's life, it was just really traumatic, I'm sure. Right? He didn't know the picture at that point. But I believe what God was doing was testing Abraham. Abraham, do you love me more than your son Isaac? Faith. Faith requires us to love him, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Do you love the Lord more than anything? Jesus said at one point, a test of discipleship, he asked his disciples, he said to them, if you're not willing to leave your father and mother, brother, sister, wife, husband, if you're not willing to leave all others, to follow me. You're not worthy of me. And I'm glad God doesn't ask us all to do that. Amen? But the truth is, is God wants our devotion. He wants all of our love. And our love for him must be preeminent. Our love for him must be foremost. Our love for him must surpass our love for anything and anyone else. And here the Lord was testing Abraham. Abraham, will you sacrifice your son for me? Do you love me more than Isaac? Faith may ask you to sacrifice what is most precious to you. I'm sure glad it doesn't always. But this is a warning for me. Don't let anything take the place of God. Lest God require it of you. Do you love 
your spouse? Do you love your kids? Do you love your toys? Anybody else get toys for Christmas? I just got meat, right? But (laughs) do you love those things in your life? Then keep them in the rightful place. Don't let them become number one. Lest God require of you. Why? Because he needs to be everything for you. Because he is everything for you. And he may require it of you, as he almost did Abraham. So Abraham offered his son Isaac. Didn't have to fall through with it, but he offered him up. He was going to go through with it. Great act of faith. Now verse 20. By, Is- by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. So it says, Jacob, who was Isaac's son, Jacob, by faith, he blessed It says, excuse me, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Isaac blessed his sons. And that was an act of faith. For a father, it is an act of faith to pass down blessing to his children, to his sons. That's what living by faith, that's that's what having faith, walking by faith looks like, dads, fathers. Are you blessing your children? Blessing them with what? Blessing them with the knowledge of God. Are you blessing your kids with setting an example for them to follow in, in the ways of God? It requires faith to do that, but that's what faith looks like. Faith is not just taking your family to church on Sunday and checking that box and thinking you're good to go. Faith is more than that. Real faith is living it out on a day-to-day basis. And like I said, there's varying degrees of faith. Some might, maybe for some, that's all you can do is just, I'm just getting my family to church and man, that's, that's my works and I don't think the Lord's going to turn that away in any shape, way, shape, or form. If, that, if the Lord knows, man, that's, that is, that's your act of service to the Lord. You can get your family to church and that's, man, that's you leading your family. The Lord's like, awesome, way to go. But I think for many of us, we can do a lot more. We can do a lot better than we are doing. We can bless our kids in many more ways than perhaps we are. If we'd turn this off or get rid of that or remove that distraction or take it easy on that pursuit and focus more on what matters, blessing our kids, passing on a godly heritage. Isaac did this. He blessed his sons. Are you blessing your sons? Something you've got to be intentional, purposeful in doing. Passing faith on to your children. A lot of men, I want to teach my sons how to hunt and fish and build stuff and do this and do that. That's all great. I want to teach my son how to work on a a car and be mechanical and all these skills. And that's awesome. But what our kids need from us the most is to show them how to follow Jesus. Follow your show your kids how to follow Christ. How How do I do that? Follow Jesus yourself. Say, come on, kids. Let's follow Jesus. Come on, let's get in the Bible. Let's read our Bibles. Let's, let's pray. Let's worship. Let's, man, let's live for the Lord. Lead by example. Bless your children. Isaac did that by faith. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. Jacob did the same. He blessed each of the sons of Joseph which were his grandsons. So just like fathers are called to bless their sons by faith, like Isaac did. Grandfathers, I would include grandmothers, are you blessing your grandchildren by faith? It takes faith to do that. To not just be the grandparent who's spoiling and sweets and treats and all the, but give them the sweetest thing of all. Teach them to follow Jesus. Teach and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Teach them to pray and pray for your grandkids. Bless them. It takes faith. That's what faith looks like. It's faith in action. This is what our faith ought to entail, you see. Now verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Joseph, his act of faith was making mention of the exodus telling people about the wonders of God. Again, I said earlier, our faith should not be private, it should be public. Are we telling people about what God has done in our lives? 
Are you, are you sharing with the people around you what God has done? People that are Christians, yeah, but people that are non-Christians as well. Sharing your testimony, sharing with people the wonders of God, how you've seen them displayed in your life. Joseph did that. When you're full of faith, you can't help but talk about the wonders of God, can you? I think some of us aren't talking about the Lord and his wonderful acts and his wonderful works very much because we're not very full of faith. Are you saying I'm not saved? I'm not questioning that at this moment. But what I'm saying is some of us are just kind of quiet because our faith is not full. How do we make our faith full? How do we build our faith? How do we get more faith? More faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many of us are not sharing what God has done with others because we, we don't have a fullness of faith in our lives. Why? Because we're not spending time gazing upon Jesus, hearing his word, spending time with him. See, how, how are you going to be motivated to talk about the Lord if you never spend time with the Lord? So when we spend time with the Lord, we're like, wow, he's awesome. He spoke this to me. Then when we're around people, we just, we want to tell them about it. You're like, I, I, why don't I ever want to talk about the Lord? Well, why am I never excited and passionate to share the wonders of God with people? Because you're not spending time with him. When you spend time with him, you go, oh yeah, he's amazing. I got to share this with people. Stay plugged in. Stay connected. Keep diving into his presence. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So an act of faith here, it's, it's interesting. It says by faith Moses was hidden. But really it was an act of faith by Moses' parents, wasn't it? His parents that said, hey, the king, the pharaoh is going to put to death all the Hebrew children, all the, all the male babies. We've got to protect this child. God's got a plan for our boy. And so they hid him. Interesting, faith may require you to hide from your own government is what basically Moses had to do. Many places in the world today, Christians are having to hide from their own governments for their safety. Many of them are having to hide their Bibles, the word of God, from the government that is over them. You know that? You guys, we are so blessed. We're so spoiled. We have Bibles like all over the place. We got Bibles in the thrift stores. We got Bibles in Walmart. Last time I checked, I don't know, hopefully I haven't taken them out yet. We got Bibles in every bookstore, right? We've got Bibles online. We can get other countries. There's places where they don't have Bibles, where they have to literally smuggle Bibles into their country. And they have to be so careful, and they can be put to death if they're caught with a Bible. Because we are so extremely blessed. But other places, they've got to hide from their own governments. There may come a time in our nation's future where there's things we've got to hide. We've got to hide from our, our government. Where we might have to go underground and be a little bit more careful. Because right now, we don't. We can preach on the street corners. I'm not saying you should do that. Usually that has a bad connotation, right? Someone on the street corner holding their sign. I'm not saying that's the most effective way to witness, but we can let it, we can let salvation ring. We, we can share the gospel out in the open square, in the public, in our workplaces. Even in government jobs, often, if you're asked by somebody, you can share with them. Let's take advantage of that. Not hide it. Because we don't have to hide it at this time, in this place, in our country. But Moses was hidden by faith. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses knew who he was. He refused to be called and joined in with the people of Egypt, the Egyptians. He said, no, I'm different. And guys, again, this goes back to our citizenship. It's in heaven. We're, we're called not to be of this world. We're in the world. Jesus prayed that over his disciples in John 17. Father, I don't pray, he said over his disciples, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. The Lord has us in this world, but we are called to be not of this world. 
That's what Moses did in his life. I'm not part of this Egyptian thing. I'm different. Verse 25, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses knew, man, I'll, I'll be ill-treated if that's what it is going to happen, but I'm not going to just enter into the passing pleasures of sin in this Egyptian culture. That's the same, same decision you and I have to make. Verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Moses didn't know it, but he was modeling what we are supposed to do, considering the reproach of Christ, living for the Lord is going to require that you're not always going to fit in to this world around us. And verse 27, Moses' faith continues. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Moses left that place. And by faith, verse 28, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. God, remember, instructed Moses. He said, the death angel is coming. The firstborn of every household will be put to death if you don't take the blood of the sacrifice and put it over the doorpost of your home. If you put the blood on there, the blood will cover your home and death will pass over that household. Again, a beautiful picture, isn't it? When we take the blood of Jesus, the blood of the sacrifice to our homes, death passes us over. Death has no more victory over us, amen? Amen. We don't fear death because death just means heaven for us as Christians because we're covered by the blood. But it took faith for Moses to implement that, to instruct the children of Israel in that. But he did. And it takes faith for you and I, guys, to apply the blood of Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your blood to cover my sin. That's an act of faith. That's part of what it means to walk in faith. It's perhaps the first step of faith that we take in becoming a Christian. Applying the blood, like at the Passover there. And by faith, verse 29, they, that is the children of Israel, passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. It took faith to see the waters part and believe that God could do the impossible. As many, many people today, many critics try and Explain this miracle away and say, oh, there's just a strong wind that, you know, sometimes there's really strong winds in that part of the world and there's a strong wind that came and it kind of, you know, separated the, the, the water a little bit and that's not what it says happened here. You with me? It doesn't say a strong wind. It says the Lord parted the Red Sea. And some people, oh, it's just kind of like a puddle. You know, the wind just blew and this puddle just kind of moved out of the way. And then they could pass through. If it was a puddle, then what was keeping them back from crossing it? And if it was a puddle, then why did the whole Egyptian army drown in it? They weren't good swimmers in Egypt, apparently. This was a sea that God miraculously parted and the children of Israel walked through on dry land. But it took their faith they had to believe that God could do this. And guys, I think there's certain things in our life that God wants to make a way. God wants to open up a path out of trouble. Uh, the enemy's in hot pursuit. He's coming. What are we going to do? Lord, I'm believing that you're going to do something here. I trust you, God. You're going to make a way. And it takes our faith being placed in him before we see a way opened up. I think oftentimes we... See things not come to pass, not because God is unable, but because we do not have faith to see it come to pass. One point Jesus was asked, hey, you know, if you can, you can heal me. If you're willing, you can heal me, was said to Jesus. If you're willing, Jesus, you can fix me. You can, you can heal this issue I've got. And Jesus responded and said, if you can, uh, I can and I'm willing. The question isn't, can I? The question is, can you? If, if you can believe, then I, I can do this thing for you. Man, exercise that great faith in a great God to do great things and open up 
paths that otherwise are impossible. That's what happened there in Egypt. God delivered them out of their, their hands. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had encircled for seven days. That took some faith. All right, we're going into battle, right? We're, we're going to go take on Jericho, this large fortified city. As the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they're just, you know, farmers and whatnot. They don't have an army officially. But the first city they come to in the promised land that God says, I'm going to give this land to you. Uh, God says, okay, here's the plan. You're going to march around the city. All right, and then what? We're going to, you know, th- throw something at it, you know, burning torches, what? You know, arrows, what? what's the plan? God, no, you're just going to walk around it. Okay, what else? And blow some trumpets. Do that. And then you're going to do that for seven days. But the last day, you're going to walk around it seven times. Okay, right? I'm following you, Lord. All right, seven times. And then what? Then you, then you shout and blow some trumpets, right? That's the plan. Uh, Lord, I think we're going to go with plan B. You know, thanks for your input. Right, if you were going into battle without major weaponry, without a, a, a solid army, you'd be coming up with a strategic plan. God's ways are not our ways. If they had gone in there with battering rams and arrows and swords, and then they would have said, we did it. But could they really say that after the defeat of Jericho? These giant walls, perhaps, you know, eight feet thick, or tw- some people say 20 feet thick, these walls, there's actually people living like Rahab in the wall of the city. So huge walls, fortified, super tall. Could they have said, we did it, after those walls came tumbling down? No. What did, they, well, what did you do? How did you overcome Jericho? Uh, we walked around it. And then what? We walked around it some more. And then we yelled at the walls. <laughs> and they came down. And people were like, uh, I don't believe you, Right? No, all they could say is, we did what the Lord said, and the walls came down. God did it. There's no human explanation for this. And guys, there are walls that God wants to bring down. Maybe walls in your life, walls at your your workplace of employment, walls in your heart, and you don't know how to, you're trying to attack them every way you know how. And the Lord says, just do what I say. Just walk. Walk with me. Talk. Talk to me. Blow the trumps. Worship me, the Lord would say. And watch and see those walls come down. Man, that, those people you see, they've got walls up. Man, pray for them. Don't use the arrows of man. Use the artillery of God, which is prayer. Man, the, the long-range offense Pray for those walls to come down and watch and see God do what only he can do. Walls will come down. Again, Jesus said, little faith can move mountains. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain, be cast in the sea, and it would do it. Jesus said that. Now, verse 31 By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Rahab. Again, Sarah was mentioned as a woman of faith in this list. The second woman and only other woman mentioned in here is Rahab. And what was she by occupation? She was a harlot. And it has her in the record of great faith in all of the stories and accounts and individuals of of the scriptures, Rahab is selected to be included in this list. Not just included, but she's the the final chapter, if you will. She's the final story specifically mentioned here in this chapter to kind of end cap it, to kind of leave you with this note, with this thought. God points out the great faith of Rahab who didn't perish with the inhabitants of Jericho when the walls came down because she took in the spies of the children of Israel beforehand and, and, and sheltered them and hid them from her own government, from her own officials, and then let them out. And before they attacked the city by walking around it, she let out that scarlet material out her, her doorway and they rescued her and got her down out of that before the walls came down. 
But Rahab, this great faith in welcoming the spies, she's commended here. Again, one of the only women, this, one of only two women mentioned in the hall of faith here. Some people have a problem with the Bible, say, with the Bible and say, and the Bible's outdated, it's chauvinistic, it's oppressive to women. Uh, I say, no way, not so. Not only are women included in the Bible, they are held up with esteem. They are pointed out as having great faith. Not just women in general, but even women of ill repute. Women like Mary Magdalene, who some believe she was a prostitute before coming to know Jesus. And yet, Mary is the first one that saw the resurrected Christ, if you recall. Went to the tomb and saw, saw the gardener there, remember? And said, where have they taken Jesus? Where have they taken? And it was Jesus all along. She thought he was the gardener. The Bible doesn't just mention women, but it exalts them and gives them privileges. And here we see that Rahab, her faith is spoken of, even though despite her being a harlot in her life, God not only accepted her, but exalted her and used her as an example for others to follow. What does this tell us? It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how much sin you've committed how filthy you feel, the rotten things you've thought or, or acted on in your life. It doesn't matter your gender, if you're a man, if you're a woman. It doesn't matter what your race is, what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what nation you're from, what demographic you belong to, or what you were born in. God is no respecter of persons, amen? He doesn't show partiality. And just like we see here with Rahab, he'll forgive and love you just the same. You can come to him, whoever you are. If you feel like Rahab, I don't think I can come to the Lord. I'm like Rahab. Well, great, because the Lord welcomed Rahab and spoke of her great faith as well. Now let's wrap up in verse 30, uh, 32. And now the author says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets. And everyone's like, amen, yeah, stop. Dude, it's like, you know, going through the whole Bible, all the Old Testament stories, and the author realizes that too. I, I don't have any more time if I talk about all the faith of all the people in the Old Testament. Man, there's so many. And he mentions some of their acts, verse 33. Again, faith in action. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, Quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword from, from weaknesses, were made strong, became mighty in war, put for, foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Wow, that's an act of faith too, you see. Being tortured. He says, some by faith were tortured. You're like, I'm going to go with the other acts of faith, Right? That's not on the top of our list. That's not the one you highlight, really, in your Bible. But others were tortured. Verse 36, And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. What a statement. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, and all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. The author says all these men and women of faith in the Old Testament, we could talk about all their acts of faith that they have done. He says, all these having gained approval through their faith. He gets back to the main point and says it's all about faith. But all these acted on their faith. Have you acted on your faith? 
Is there action to your faith? Or are you just coming and believing and learning and trying to grow your faith, but it's not affecting your life at all? I would encourage you to act on your faith. Take the first step of faith, the first action of faith. And the first, the first step of taking faith is putting your trust in Jesus, applying that blood to the sins in your life, accepting his sacrifice on the cross to cleanse you from your sin. Have you made that first step of faith? Have you taken that first act of faith? You can. You can do that right now. You can do that anytime. Like I said earlier, it's not about repeating a certain mantra or a certain saying or a certain creed or you just, in the way you know how to communicate with the Lord, say, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I, I believe you died for my sins and I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. I believe you're God and I'm not. And I, I want to be with you forever. I want to be with you in heaven. You can say that however you want to. Give your life to Jesus and then follow Jesus. You see, you don't give your life to him and then just take off. He doesn't give it back. You ever tried to run away from the Lord? Here you are. You're back here, right? It's known as bungee theology, right? No matter how, you can try to run from the Lord, but man, you're going to come back to him. He'll bring you back. He goes after the, the one. He leaves the 99. He'll go after you. Is that a threat? Maybe. You, you try to leave the Lord, he's coming after you. Like the wayward sheep, he might even break your legs so you can't run away again. But Bungie, the, man, he, he will come after you. And I'm so thankful for that, aren't you, that the Lord pursues us. So thankful that the Lord comes after us. He doesn't let us go. He doesn't let us do what we would want to do. He doesn't let us walk, continue to walk in our stupidity. He disciplines his children. He chastens us. We'll talk about that more next time in chapter 12.